So I want to introduce you to talk to you a little bit about the standards that we're going to use um, to Ian Bailey. So Ian is an experienced startup CEO um, with an emphasis on data integration and data science. Um, he is um, a globally recognized enterprise architecture. You wouldn't know that, would you? No. Uh, the reason I know that is because chat GT, GPT told me. Oh, really? uh, yes, it created a bio for you, for me. It was great. It was really, really good. It tells me that I'm really good as well. So it might not be right. Sorry, bud. Um, uh, so globally recognized enterprise architecture authority and it has been uh, the lead architect on the eight uh, the multi-billion pound budget programs as well as technical lead for the MOD and NATO architecture frameworks. So Ian has represented the UK government and industry at international bodies and holds a PhD in data mapping and a first degree in engineering. That's pretty impressive, sir. So I shall hand you over um, <laughs> to run through IES4. Just either click on the buttons or down on the um, Brilliant. keyboard. Thank you. Well, normally, if you Google Ian Bailey, you, you get a murderer. There's, a, there's, there's quite a famous murderer called it. So I'm quite chuffed chat GPT didn't have me up there as a mass murderer or something. Right. <laughs> Great way to start. Okay. Hello. Uh, I'm Ian. Um, I don't need to introduce myself to her because that's, that's uh, been done in a way that's just embarrassed me completely now. Thanks, Ian. Um, right. So I'm, I'm going to talk about IES now. Um, IES is a rather unimaginatively titled Information Exchange Standard. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of history about it. But it's probably worth saying right up front, there's a, there's a bit of a circular story to this. I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. And I only realised it when I saw your, your opening slide with all the sponsors on there, that actually there's quite a few of the sponsors of this event are, were the pioneers of some of this stuff originally. So. Um, but anyway, so this is, this is IES, and the reason IES is being featured is it's been selected as the data standard for the UK National Digital Twin Programme. Um, and how we got there, I'll try and try and explain to you now. So what is it? As I said, the, not the most imaginative title in the world. Um, it originated out of the MOD and related agencies. So it was a recognition within government that lots of agencies that didn't normally talk to each other perhaps as much as they should, police, home office, MOD, intelligence agencies, uh, cabinet office, and various other bits and pieces of government, um, were tending to share information in reports. Civil services dominated by classics graduates. And I'm not saying they like to write essays, but they do like to write essays. And they like to share those essays around which was, which was okay, but they were writing those essays based on data coming out of analytical systems. They were writing a report on it, passing it to another agency that was then re-entering it into their intelligence analysis systems, and on and on it went. And, you know, hamsters on wheels springs to mind. Um, but this was going on all over government. So there was a recognition that, that it would be good to have a data standard that could capture this kind of stuff. Now, um, the interesting thing about the information they were sharing, which was kind of, I guess you'd call it assessed intelligence or analysis or whatever it might be. That could be anything from economic and political data through to terrorism, through to military stuff or policing. It's a fairly broad remit. Um, the, you, you never know what you're going to be dealing with. So they're kind of, they're, there aren't that many fixed fields and that should come out of this presentation. This The flexibility is the most important part of the IES standard. So it's designed from the get-go to let you pretty much exchange whatever kind of information you want, but attempts to do that unambiguously. And that's a very difficult thing to do, to have that degree of flexibility and yet cut out the ambiguity. But it does a pretty good job of it, I think. Um, anyway, a little bit on the history. And that's a big slide, probably unreadable from the back of the room or probably totally unreadable on Teams. But um, where it came from, uh, uh, the, the IES standard is what's known as a 4D ontology. You used to not be able to say ontology in, in public presentations, but it seems to have caught on recently and lots of people say it, so it's fine now. So IES is a 4D ontology and, and these 4D ontologies are sort of originated in the oil and gas industry. So I saw Shell and Fluor were on the um, 
sponsors this. They were two of the key companies that did a lot, particularly Shell. Matthew West, you know Matthew, used to be head of standards at Shell. So they pioneered a lot of this work. And a couple of standards came out of it. So ISO 15926, that's a big oil and gas standard. They use these kind of 4D ontology. These are similar situations. There's that much variety in data. And I guess it's the same in the building and construction. Uh, and you get the same types of things being reused in lots of different ways over time uh, in process plants and refineries, oil rigs and so on, um, that you needed a, a flexible data standard that was unambiguous. And it's, the, and it's that flexibility with, with the disambiguation in there that, that makes it really appeal for, for the, um, for the uh, national security community when they picked up IES. But also, I think for the National Digital Twin Program, when it's picked up IES as the standard to use for, for digital twins. So I'll go into a little bit of background. So this is kind of where it, what it's really about in in the main. It's a data exchange standard. So the idea is that Party A has got their own system. They've got their own data in it. They handle the data the way they want to. That system was built to do a specific job. Uh, has its own data model or ontology inside. Um, and it, and it doesn't conform to any standards really because it was just built to do the job it was meant to do. And then you've got system another system over in party B, again, built to different specifications for a different purpose or maybe the same purpose. But you know, you put two data models in a room, give them the same problem, they come up with 11 different data models. So chances of them having the same data model internally are pretty remote. So the idea is you build an interface uh, to your system so you can squirt out an IES file, the receiving party can then convert that IES file back to their format and read it in, which looks like quite a bit of work when you've only got party A and B, but when you've got 20 of these parties all sharing data on a major program, that turns into a bit of a, a rat's nest of data exchanges if you're going point to point all the time, but if you're just going via one format, you only have to do it once for every system. So that was the idea with, with that. Um, there was also quite a lot of interest around, and this is where I have to fess up, um, I think Ian mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm the founder of Telesynth. We've been working on the secure data platform aspects of uh, the UK National Digital Twin Programme. Um, and our interest was, it was in building this type of architecture, which is about uh, big distributed systems where you want to keep them all in sync, but you want to do that in a standardized way. And we saw a lot of potential in this IES standard to uh, allow you to go to market with a product that uh, was standardized in the way it moved data around, but was then extensible and flexible, which was a pretty rare combination. So that's what we really liked about the IES standard. Uh, but this was, a, this was another um, um, a proposed uh, were a use of IES in the kind of defense and national security sector. Uh, I should say, these aren't my slides, these are slides from the MOD. Um, so they're all Crown copyright, if anyone did say, yeah, Crown copyright on them. Um, and finally, um, uh, quite a few of the agencies were very keen um, to not have their data locked into systems. So they would buy a commercial intelligence management system or digital twin system or something like that. And it would have its own proprietary format internally. Once the data was in there, it was very difficult to get it out again. So there was a lot of interest in, could you build databases that were compliant to the IES standard so that at some point, if you ever want to get your data out of that system, you've got, you've got, a, uh, you've got a standard to work to, an easy way to get your data out. So that was the idea. So that's a bit of background. The standard itself is layered. So version four of the standard, all these things get squished together into one uh, data format that's published. There's a GitHub page for it which I haven't put in the link, but I'll tweet it in a minute when I'm sat back down again with the, with the link to it. And there's a GitHub page you can go and see the spec and dig into it and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but version four, it, whilst it's layered, you, you, it's all in one spec. Version five, which they've just started talking about now, they will split it into three separate standards because um, as I hinted at earlier, the, the number of different interested parties that are wanting to use IES now is increasing. It's gone from being quite defense and policing focused through to 
now uh, digital twins and of course digital twins covers everything you think of from building and construction to aircraft to oil rigs to whatever it might be so the, the the interest is widening out and i don't think it's sustainable longer term for the standard to stay one big monolithic standard it'll probably become a group of standards all off some some basic concepts and foundation but the really cool thing about IES and what makes it flexible is it, it just focuses on stuff that everyone deals with. So when you look in the domain concepts, you, you're, you're going to find people, organizations, places, assets, and it doesn't go much deeper into it. It doesn't really tie you into a specific way of working. You can do that yourself by extending it. So you can extend the ontology locally for your business purpose and, and, and work with it that way. So that's kind of the idea. Now this one, I've presented this couple, these set of slides a couple of times before to Americans and I lost them completely because they didn't know what Airfix was. Um, but, so to try and get to the point, so traditionally if you, if you build a data model, uh, what you're trying to do is build the optimal structure to store the data you need to solve your problem. So you've got a very well-defined problem, hopefully, and you want a very well-defined solution for it. So you build uh, a high fidelity data structure that will hold exactly the data you want to do, you want to hold and, and return it to you in a timely manner in a structure you can work with it and so on. And that's been the way people have traditionally built system data models for donkey's years. But there's a problem with that. That requirement you build it to is today's requirement. Tomorrow's requirement will be different and a requirement in two years time are different again. And those um, very specific data models are quite hard to change over time because you tend to implement quite a lot of infrastructure around that. You've got middleware, you've got front ends, and they're all working to the same model. You want to make a change, it gets really, really hard and really, really expensive. So I've tried to liken it to an Airfix kind of model. So if you build an Airfix model, it really looks like the airplane you wanted to build, right? If you do it in Lego, you've really got to squint a bit to make that look like a, a, a SR-71 Blackbird. But the really cool thing about doing it in Lego is if you suddenly decide that you're not building Blackbirds today, you want to build Concorde tomorrow, you can take all the bits apart and put them back together. And there are certain rules about how all those bits fit together and the parts can move. Uh, you try and do that with an Airfix model, you have the heat gun, soldering iron hacksaw, and a mess on your hands and glue everywhere. You know, it's not going to look like much like a, a usable Concorde at the end of it. So that's the compromise they've gone for with IES. It, it's, you've got to squint a bit to, to understand, so it takes a little bit of getting your head around that they've used these common patterns that are common to all kinds of industries, but then you can specialize them for your own use and, 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 and shape them around the way you want them. But they all fit together in a very specific way. So it's a bit like building a Lego model rather than a... Anyway, that's a bit too much of a metaphor. I'll stop at that one. Um, so um, I say I'll tweet out the um, the link to the GitHub site for IES in a bit. But at the top of the model, uh, we we do it all in UML. So if you're familiar with the UML modeling language, uh, it seemed to be what the the world wanted. So uh, the IES team opted for for UML. Um, and right at the top, we've got this 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 top of the shop, if you like, is exchanged item. Everything in the model is an exchanged item. And then it immediately splits into elements. So elements are things you can kick. Elements are things that have, uh, to quote Matthew S, spatio-temporal extent. So stuff that existed in the past, present or future that had some kind of physicality to it. And you can have relationships like one physical thing is part of another. So you can see these are very, very high level patterns and IES goes down a little bit further than that. But really what it's trying to do is, is tease out all those kind of generic real world patterns that anyone might want in their data to do stuff. And then you've got types of things. So this is class of elements. So that's the kind of thing you'd find in Uniclass or any of those kind of categorization standards that you work with in, in this industry. So I mentioned 4D earlier. Um, I'll try and do a bit on that. So this is a space time diagram. Um, these first started to appear in uh, a couple of books. There's, so there's a couple of books on this subject. In fact, I've got three of them there. So this How Things Persist, Catherine Hawley's a philosopher. So that's the kind of philosophical background to all this. So she's a, a logician and, and philosopher. 
Um, and then you've got two other books. You've got uh, Business Objects Reengineering for Reuse and Developing High Quality Mo Data Models by Matthew West. But these space time charts originated from Einstein and Minkowski originally. They flipped them on the, through 90 degrees. I think they had space along the x axis. We have time along the x axis and space on the y axis. And basically, what you do is you say these things there, these elements that I talked about earlier, these things with this spatio temporal extent you split them up into states. So you've got the whole life Fred here. And because there's a pointy end on that, it means Fred's not dead yet. Fred's still alive and kicking. And what we've done is we've picked some states of Fred. So these little temporal chunks of Fred are a way to split him up into different stages of his life, which allows us in one data set to do that thing that quite often, always amazes me this, but quite often data models really struggle with this, to cope with the idea that there are three masses for Fred. So when he was a baby, he weighed three and a half kilos, then he was 25 kilos, then he was 92 kilos and so on. Um, that kind of idea looks really simple when you do like, you'd be amazed how many systems can't do that. And if you want to get the, the, the previous weights for something, you've got to go talk to the sysadmins, they're pulling backup tapes and all sorts of nonsense to try and find historical measurements on things. So. Just things like this, which we all really want to do, but our systems won't let us do. IES does it natively. That's the kind of idea. Um, and you can get a bit more complicated. So this is a quite a complicated space-time diagram. So if something's not moving, it will be flat on the y-axis. So this is probably a location. I think in this particular case, it was a hospital. Um, so the orange thing is a location. The blue thing here, I think, is a person. I think it's actually Fred. So Fred's bumbling along, then he goes into the hospital, there's a state of Fred while he's in the hospital, then he comes out and he goes off and does something else. Um, and this thing here is a period of time, because the really nice thing about this is you can model periods of time as objects as well, which is really nice because you can put lots of things connected to the same period of time, which is great for indexing your databases and, and so on. Um, so these are the kind of things you can do, these space-time diagrams, and the model allows you to have this sophisticated approach to to space and time. What have I done? Have I done that right? There we go. Um, so in this in these spatiotemporal things, these elements, we've got entities. So there's a little bit of blurring around this. It's not quite as clear cut a division between these things as you might think, but we've got entities. So those those are things like people, places, devices, vehicles, that kind of stuff. States, those are those temporal chunks like you saw of Fred earlier. Events, so those are activities. Those tend to be things where you've got more than one entity participating. Um, we treat those as spatiotemporal because events have a location and they occupy space. This event today is occupying this room, so it's definitely got space and time associated with it, so there's nothing unphysical about events. And then, as I mentioned before, periods of time. And then the rest of the OIS standard just descends from this. And it doesn't, as I mentioned, doesn't go too far down into it. It leaves you plenty of options about where to go about your own specialization, but it kind of stops at the person, organization, device kind of stuff I was talking about. So you can put something really specialized in there, but when it gets to the other end, the receiving party knows it's a mobile phone because that's in the standard, but you've also put that it's a Samsung blah, 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 which they might not know about, but you've just added extra information to the standard. That's all. They still know they've got a mobile phone. So that, that's kind of the way it works. Um, so there's your periods of time again. So what you can see here is a kind of cross section of space and time. So we've got, um, there's Fred, and we've, we've cross sectioned him with time. So we've basically said when he was measured at 92 kilos, that measurement was done inside that period of time. And that, this has been particularly useful for policing and um, national security purposes where the, the, the information is a bit woolly. You know something happened last week, you don't know what date it happened or what time, but you know it happened last week. They get their information in kind of quite patchy chunks, um, particularly in policing, I think. Um, uh, and, the, and the other thing you can do with this is you can have activities. I mentioned events earlier, so this is a meeting. So imagine this meeting today. How many people have got in this room? About 40 people. Imagine 40 blue lines all coming from all over the country into this room. The meeting takes place in the room and then after today everyone goes their separate ways and comes back tomorrow, for example. So that's how it deals with events. So 
everything's built up from these really kind of uh, granular building blocks of states, events, uh, entities, and so on, and the relationships between them. Um, it's got this idea of bounding states as well. So you can put bounding states on things. So I've got this participation of this of Bob in this uh, meeting, and I can put bounding states on either end, and I can say those bounding states are in the period of time. So again, it's like Lego. I'm using the same things over and over again at a, a more granular level. But what that allows us to do is be, I mentioned earlier about, what's, what's the, there's a term in government, is it constructive ambiguity they talk about in government? That's not really what I mean. This is precise ambiguity, right? So we're dealing with ambiguous data. The, re the real world is messy. We don't know everything all the time. But what we want is a way to be able to say what, how much we do know and allow uh, other parties later to add more detail without breaking what we've done. So this is built from that principle. Um, so what we've got there is a gray thing, top left hand corner, that's a period of time. And we've got something happened in that period of time. That's as much as information as we've got. It happened last year. We don't know how long it took. It might have taken one second. It might have taken six months. All we know is it happened last year and we can be that vague. Um, we can put a bounding state on the start and say, look, we know when it started. Uh, sorry, we know it started. We don't know when it started and we know it's still going, but it hasn't ended yet. So you can be really vague like that and you can say, oh, it started and it finished, but I've no clue when it started or when it finished. And then I can add some times. I know when it started. I know it's finished, but I don't know when. I know when it started and I know when it finished. And you can imagine with these kind of Lego bricks, you can build quite sophisticated models of um, how things happen in space and time. So it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, and you can see how it came from the, from the, from the um, process industries, because they're all about bits of kit in a refinery. You take a pump out, you move it, it goes back to be repaired. When it comes back, it doesn't go into the same tag number it came out of, it goes into a different location. That ability to track how things move through space and time um, is really useful in asset management. So that, that's where this originally came from. Um, I think I've probably covered that one. That's Fred going into the, into the hospital, as I mentioned, his way in there. And I think this is me done, yeah. Um, so I've only shown you a tiny bit of IES there, but you've already got an ability with this to move people around, things around, talk how things connect and change over time. Um, and to do that in as vague or specific a way as you want to. And that's the really important thing because you know, you're dealing with patchy information in the most part. And um, I guess that's probably the case with the Royal Engineers as well in, in kind of messy environments like disaster relief and so on. Um, yeah, and it's all using the same stuff. It's all Lego and you can just glue it all together. So I'll post out some links in a bit. Has anybody got, got any time for questions or am I? Uh... We'll, we'll save them for the end.